Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so before we start, I want to say a, a few uh, words about the exam on Thursday. Uh, I think everybody should be aware now that uh, we're going to do the exam through the B courses website and uh, using the quiz function. Uh, and so the exam will be just true, false, multiple choice, and uh, possibly some short essay responses. Uh, in, in terms of uh, content, uh, everything up through the end of lecture today will be covered. Um, focus will be on the things we, we've discussed since the previous exam, since exam one. Um, again, the exam will be open book, open notes, uh, but you're on the honor system not to communicate with others and, and take assistance from anyone else. Um, any questions on the exam? Okay, good. Uh, so today we have another uh, expert guest speaker, um, and it's Dr. Brandon Barnett, who's an expert in organometallic uh, reactivity, and uh, he's about to start as an assistant professor at University of Rochester, um, but today he's going to cover uh, the topic of transition metal catalysis. Um, please remember to mute uh, your microphones unless you're asking a question. Also, if you uh, have a question during his presentation, you can raise your hand um, and he can then call on you. Okay, Brandon, go ahead. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, just a, a quick word about uh, a question. Zoom has been kind of uh, on and off about letting me, notifying me if anybody raises their hand. So if you raise your hand and I don't see it, um, feel free to send me a private message in the chat. Um, that's been popping up a lot more reliably and I should definitely see that. Um, okay, yeah, so we're gonna talk a little bit about catalysis and catalysis using transition metals today. Um, and so if you're particularly interested in applied chemistry and, and kind of understanding maybe how uh, some of the molecules that, that you've seen in the, the 104A and 104B are used practically and in chemical industry. Hopefully this will be uh, of interest to you um, to see how some of these, uh, these interesting species can be put to use. Uh, okay. Um, so we can kind of just very broadly uh, talk about catalysis um, in two different classes. Um, so homogeneous versus heterogeneous catalysis. In homogeneous catalysis, we're gonna have our catalyst as well as all of our reactants in the same phase. And that's typically going to be in the liquid phase. So everything is going to be dissolved in some solvent. Uh, in heterogeneous catalysis, our catalyst is going to be in a different phase from all of our reactants. And so most typically our catalyst is going to be a solid state catalyst and our reactants are going to be either liquids or gases. Um, and so in the chemical industry, heterogeneous catalysis is used far more commonly than homogeneous catalysis. And, and there's some reasons for that. Uh, you can imagine that uh, separating a catalyst after a reaction is over when everything is dissolved in solution might be rather challenging. Whereas if you have a solid catalyst and, and all of your reactants and your products are in a different phase, removing them from what's left over of the catalyst is going to be oftentimes rather trivial. Um, also to reduce operating costs in industry, you ideally want to be able to use a catalyst many times over and just cycle a reactor over and over and over many times before you have to replace it. And so solid state heterogeneous catalysts tend to have very high stabilities and very high activities. And so oftentimes that means that they're going to be preferred uh, for a given transformation um, so that they can be used as many times as possible to make as much product as possible. Um, despite that, there are some times when homogeneous catalysis is preferred. Um, homogeneous catalysts uh, 
oftentimes are going to operate at much lower temperatures under much milder conditions. Um, they tend to have much more well-defined active sites and mechanisms compared to their heterogeneous counterparts. And so oftentimes we can use homogeneous catalysts somewhat as a model to help us understand what's going on um, uh, in a heterogeneously catalyzed process. Um, okay, so before we start talking about some specific mechanisms, uh, we need to go over some, um, some kind of basic organometallic reactivity that hasn't been covered in this course yet. Um, and so the first that we're going to talk about is insertion reactivity into carbonyl ligands. Uh, um, and so this can be a really important step that can allow us to form a new bond to carbon here, a carbon hydrogen bond. And so in this first example, um, we're just looking at the insertion of a hydride ligand or a hydrogen bound to a metal into a carbonyl ligand. And so uh, this type of insertion uh, is termed a 1-1 insertion. Um, it's just called that because the metal and the hydrogen are ending up bound to the same atom. Um, and that atom is just one atom away from the metal center. So that's kind of where that 1-1 nomenclature comes from. Um, so this is going to result in what was previously two different ligands bound to the metal combining into one ligand. In this case, this is going to be a four mil ligand. So that's going to result in a new coordination site opening up on the metal center. And so uh, because of that, we're likely going to have an exogenous two electron donor ligand that can come in afterwards and occupy that coordination, that coordination site to get us back to a saturated complex. Um, in order for this insertion process to occur, the ligand that's inserting into carbonyl is going to need to be cis to carbonyl. So the hydride ligand, in this case, would not be able to insert into the trans carbonyl ligand. It's going to need to be close to the, the carbonyl that it's going to insert into. Uh, another thing to point out is that this is a process that occurs with no formal change in the redox state of the metal, okay? So in electron counting formalisms, this four mil is going to be counted as an anionic ligand, just as the hydride is. Um, so in both cases here, these would be metal centers with a formally plus one oxidation state. Um, so insertions can also occur with other types of ligands into carbonyl. In practice, any formally anionic ligand could undergo this 1-1 insertion. In principle, though, it's typically only observed with hydrides and with anionic uh, carbon-based ligands. So hydrocarbyl type ligand here, that hydrocarbyl would just kind of be a generic term for methyl, ethyl propyl, um, just some sort of carbon-based anionic ligand. Um, and so that could undergo an analogous insertion into a cis-CO. This is in this case going to give us an acyl ligand, which will also be counted as formally anionic. Uh, and once again, leave an open coordination site um, that will then likely be taken up by an exogenous donor ligand. Uh, so how does this insertion process occur? Um, so this does not go by an associative process where that, that exogenous ligand is coming in and first binding to the metal center. This is going through an unsaturated intermediate. Uh, formally, what's happening is this R group, whether it be a hydride or a hydrocarbyl ligand, is itself moving and inserting into this cis-CO ligand um, and giving us this uh, intermediate that's unsaturated. Um, and then in that second step, we can have that ligand come in and, and occupy that open coordination site. Um, the reverse process, deinsertion, this is just going to be the microscopic reverse of the insertion reaction. So it's just going to happen by um, that same mechanism, just put in reverse. Um, so we're first going to get uh, uh, ejection of this donor ligand to give us this unsaturated intermediate and then deinsertion to give us back uh, our metal center bound to either a hydride or a hydrocarbyl ligand. Um, so you can kind of think of this insertion reactivity as happening by the anionic ligand uh, being somewhat nucleophilic and attacking this open pi star orbital that's on the carbonyl ligands. And so, 
sigma donation from a carbonyl to a metal, of course, is going to take some of this electron density from carbon and kind of delocalize it into a metal-based orbital. And so that's going to result in a partial positive charge building up on carbon, which is going to make it somewhat electrophilic. Uh, this can be somewhat counterbalanced if you have the carbonyl ligand bound to a very electron-rich metal center, which is able to undergo pi back bonding with CO. So we remember that carbonyl is kind of our quintessential pi acceptor ligand. And so in, in transition metal complexes uh, that are uh, in low oxidation states or bound to electron-rich metal centers, we can get this pi back donation into this same orbital that would be attacked by our anionic ligand nucleophile. And so as transition metal complexes start to get more and more electron rich, CO ligands on them tend to become less and less susceptible to undergoing uh, this migratory insertion reactivity. So if you were to be asked which of these two isoelectronic complexes would be more prone to undergoing insertion of the methyl ligand, into CO. Um, think about just for a second which you think might undergo these processes more readily. So both of these are 18 electron complexes. Um, in the case of iron though, we have an anionic charge. So that should mean that there's gonna be a lot more back bonding from iron to CO. In the iron complex, than there is from cobalt to CO in the cobalt complex. So that would mean that the cobalt complex is likely going to undergo much faster and more facile migratory insertion of the methyl complex uh, compared to the iron complex. Okay. Uh, a second type of insertion reactivity um, that's, that's very prevalent and very common in organometallic chemistry and is also important in some of the catalytic reactions that we'll look at are insertions of anionic ligands into alkene ligands, okay? Um, and so this is in many ways analogous to the CO insertions that we just looked at with an important difference being that this R group that's migrating is not going to go to the same carbon that's bound to the metal. It's going to end up bound one carbon away. And so in this case, this is what we would term a one, two insertion. And so what it kind of looks like is happening is that this alkene is just inserting itself directly into this metal R bond with uh, metal and R being bound to, to the two different olefinic carbons. Um, once again, we have to have cis, uh, cis orientation between the migrating R group and the olefin for this to occur. Um, just as we saw with CO, this is going to result in this intermediate where we have an open coordination site at the metal, uh, and there's also going to be no change in the formal oxidation state of the metal. Um, in terms of the thermodynamics of this transformation, this is usually going to be thermodynamically more downhill when R is a carbon-based hydrocarbon ligand than when R is a hydride ligand. And, and you can kind of just think about why that might be the case. And when we're migrating, we're going to break this metal carbon bond uh, and we're going to form a new carbon R bond. And so if R is a carbon-based uh, if R was a carbon-based ligand, we're forming a new carbon-carbon bond here, which we know are very, very strong bonds. A carbon-carbon bond is typically going to be significantly stronger than a metal carbon bond, and so this is usually going to be quite downhill thermodynamically. Uh, in the case of a hydride, where we're breaking a metal hydrogen bond and we're forming a new carbon-hydrogen bond, uh, this can oftentimes be much closer to thermoneutral, and some would not be uncommon that you might have a very fast equilibrium between those two species uh, for a hydride ligand. Uh, and somewhat analogously to carbonyl insertions, you can think of this anionic ligand when it inserts attacking this open pi star orbital that's on the olefin. And so just like CO, olefins can act as pi acceptor ligands in electron-rich transition metal complexes. And so if we have the olefin bound to a very electron-rich complex and we have a lot of back bonding, that's sort of going to attenuate the electrophilic character of the carbon atoms and is going to decrease Increase its aptitude uh, to want to undergo migratory insertion reactivity. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so the first examples I showed were just for insertions into an ethylene ligand, which is uh, the smallest uh, olefin and it's completely symmetric. When we start to get to larger olefins where we no longer have uh, the same substituents on the two olefinic carbons, you can start to get different regioselectivities for these insertion reactions. And so, so this R group could end up inserting and going to either this terminal carbon or to this internal carbon. And that's gonna give us two different alkyl ligands in this product. And so if R goes to this kind of C1 here and metal goes to C2, that's gonna give us a secondary alkyl ligand. Whereas R migrating to this internal carbon is going to give us a primary alkyl ligand here. And this is gonna be really important uh, for determining uh, regioselectivity and, and some different catalytic reactions that we're going to look at in a little bit. Um, let's see here. So for insertions where uh, the migrating ligand is a uh, hydrocarbyl carbon-based ligand, uh, kind of as I mentioned, that's usually very thermodynamically downhill, and that's typically not a reversible reaction. So you, you don't get the reverse of that reaction when R is carbon. When R is hydrogen, though, as I said, that's oftentimes very close to a thermoneutral reaction, um, and the activation barrier for going forwards and backwards is usually very, very low. Um, and so you have to consider the deinsertion reverse of hydride insertion into an olefin. Um, and so that can occur, and it's oftentimes turned to beta hydride elimination. The beta nomenclature coming from here is just saying that the hydride is bound to the carbon that is two atoms away from the metal. This would be termed the alpha carbon. This would be termed the beta carbon. And so in hydrocarbon ligands, the beta carbon tends to be at just a very convenient position where it's easy for that ligand to bend over and place one of its hydrogens kind of right over that unsaturated intermediate. Um, and so if we have an unsaturated transition metal complex that has any beta hydrides on it, uh, it's usually not gonna stick around for very long. This is a very common and facile mode of reactivity uh, for lower coordinate complexes that have beta hydrides in the ligand. Um, and this is not just limited to hydrocarbyl based ligands. So alkoxide, amide ligands, lots of different ligands that they have a beta hydride in them. And the, car the, the metal center is low coordinate. Um, beta hydride elimination will oftentimes be rather facile. And so if you want to try to isolate an organometallic complex uh, that is lower coordinate, a design strategy that would likely be wise to pursue is to not have any beta hydrides around. And so these are a couple examples of five coordinate tantalum complexes that are kinetically stable at ambient temperatures due to the fact that they don't have any beta hydrides, right? So this is kind of the beta carbon here in this benzyl ligand, there's no hydrogen there. And in pentamethyl tantalum, obviously there are no beta hydrides there. And so this is also uh, a rather stable molecule. Okay, and so this is the first catalytic reaction that we're gonna look at. And the only steps that it really involves are hydride insertion and beta hydride elimination. And so uh, this is a mechanism for alkene isomerization that can be catalyzed really by a range of different metal hydride catalysts, which is showing a cobalt one catalyst here as an example. Um, there are times in industry when this reaction might be done on purpose. Oftentimes this is going to be a reaction that we have to consider might be simultaneously occurring uh, as we're carrying out a different reaction that involves a metal hydride intermediate. And we'll see an example of that in a little bit. Um, so this is just looking at the isomerization of one pentene to the two isomers of two pentene. The way this is occurring is we have a cobalt center with a, a hydride. It can bind our metal site, our uh, olefin, sorry. Uh, and we can undergo insertion of the hydride into the olefin. Um, and so that's going to give us, in this case, uh, this can give us a two pentyl ligand right here, right? So this is our hydride that inserted. Um, this could go one of two ways. It could go just right backwards by beta hydride eliminating this hydrogen. Um, and that's just going to give us back this. 
We also have a second position though, where we have a beta carbon with hydrogens on it. And it's these with the hydrogens in red. And so if we beta hydride eliminate one of these hydrogens, that's then going to give us a new hydride ligand, but it's now going to give a ligated two pentene ligand. And this could then dissociate just to give free two pentene. Okay. Uh, this insertion right here, I'll point out, could also occur. We could get the other regioisomer, so we could get a one pentyl ligand here, and that would occur by the hydride migrating to this secondary carbon and the cobalt center being bound to this primary carbon. That would give us a one pentyl ligand. Okay, uh, two other types of reactivity that are, are really critical and, and prevalent in a, a host of different uh, catalytic mechanisms are oxidative addition and reductive elimination. And so we're going to go through those briefly. Oxidative addition uh, refers to the addition of two different substituents uh, to a metal center whereby we're breaking a bond between those two centers that are binding to the metal. And so this is just some exogenous molecule that's coming in and is interacting with our metal site, um, and we break that XY bond and form a new MX and a new MY bond. So a few features uh, that are important for oxidative addition to occur. We're going to need this metal site that's going to undergo oxidative addition to be coordinatively unsaturated because we're going to form two new bonds in this case. And so an octahedral complex, say, is likely not going to be able to go oxidative addition unless it first undergoes some ligand dissociation processes to get it down to a lower coordination number. Unlike the insertion processes that we looked at, this is a process where there's formal redox activity at the metal center. And that's where the oxidative, in the name oxidative addition comes from. And so this is going to necessitate an increase of two oxidation state units of the metal center. And so uh, you can kind of figure out from that formalism that we're calculating both the X and the Y ligands as anionic ligands. Um, this is also going to be a process that is generally more favorable and faster for more electron rich complexes because if we already have a metal in a high oxidation state if it were to undergo oxidation oxidative addition that's going to then push it to even two oxidation states higher um, and so this is generally more relevant for metals that are maybe in the zero or the plus one oxidation state that can easily accommodate an increase uh, by two units in their formal oxidation states. Uh, thinking about what types of metals on the periodic table are, are most prone to undergo oxidative addition. Uh, generally, if you're just thinking within one group, uh, going down the uh, one column of the periodic table, generally as you go down further to the heavier metals, those tend to undergo oxidative addition more readily compared to their lighter metal counterparts. Um, I'll also mention that basically all of the reactivity that we're going to look at today, and in fact, almost nearly all uh, of the most important uh, catalytic processes that are carried out in industry rely on one of these nine metals. Um, so this is group eight, nine, and 10 on the periodic table. Colloquially, these nine metals, you might sometimes hear them referred to as the platinum group metals. Um, that's a little bit strange because we usually refer to a group as just one column on the periodic table. Um, so it's kind of some older nomenclature. Um, but if you ever see the platinum group metals referred to, that's generally just referring to these nine metals. Um, and, and they do hold a lot of relevance and importance for, for some really critical reactivity. Um, so the types of bonds that will undergo oxidative addition, uh, um, you need to think about the thermodynamics here. So you're going to break this XY bond, you're going to form two new bonds to X and Y. Um, and so the types of bonds that are prone to undergo oxidative addition are likely going to be those where you have a weaker XY bond and can form relatively strong MX and MY bonds. And so some types of bonds that oftentimes meet those criteria are carbon halide bonds with the exception of fluoride. Carbon fluoride bonds almost never undergo oxidative addition, but cobalt chloride, bromide, iodide um, oftentimes can very easily undergo oxidative addition to an electron-rich metal center. Dihalogen, certainly, as well as dihydrogen. 
uh, and there are certain times when carbon hydrogen bonds can undergo oxidative addition. This is usually a much more difficult oxidative addition uh, from a thermodynamic perspective, but it can happen um, and it can happen in some, some very important catalytic processes. So reductive elimination then is just the microscopic reverse of oxidative addition. So we're going to eliminate these metal uh, X, metal Y bonds, form this new X, Y bond, and give us a new coordination complex that has uh, two fewer ligands bound to it. And so uh, the oxidation state also decreases by two if metal's being formally reduced, hence the name. Um, and this is generally going to be a process that is occurs in a more facile manner for higher oxidation state, more electron poor metals um, that can readily accommodate an increase in two units in their formal oxidation state. Um, and so if you have X and Y being two anionic carbon-based ligands, carbon-carbon uh, oxidative addition then oftentimes would be very thermodynamically downhill. Um, without too high of an activation barrier. Carbon hydrogen uh, oftentimes will readily go uh, reductive elimination um, and dihydrogen as well. Um, might not have the same thermodynamic driving force as a reductive elimination involving carbon, um, but will usually have a very, very small kinetic barrier to undergoing that reductive elimination. Okay, so let's look a little bit at the hydrogenation of alkenes. So this is a really, really important uh, process that's performed in on enormous scales in the chemical industry, really important in pharmaceutical chemistry as well. Um, more often than not, alkene hydrogenation is carried out using heterogeneous catalysis. Um, but we're going to look at one uh, catalyst, one homogeneous catalyst that's really, really good at performing alkene hydrogenation, um, and that's Wilkinson's catalyst. So this is a rhodium-based catalyst. Um, take a second and make sure that you all can figure out what the electron count and the point group of this molecule is. Okay, so this is rhodium. We have one anionic ligand, that being chlorine, that's bound to it, and then three two electron donor phosphines. Um, so that means that this is rhodium one, uh, which is going to be D8. Uh, this is a square planar complex, right? So in thinking about its point group, we have our, our highest uh, our highest order rotation axis is going to be a C2 axis that just runs through this phosphorus rhodium chloride bond. Uh, we don't have any sigma H planes, but we do have a sigma V plane, and that's just the plane of the molecule. And so this is going to be in the C2V point group. So I do want to point out that for these platinum group metals that I talked about a second ago, uh, the D8 electronic configuration tends to heavily favor square planar complexes, especially for the second and third row metals in those groups. Um, so anytime if you see rhodium, palladium, platinum, iridium, and, and you see a D8 electron count, more often than not, it's going to want to adopt this four coordinate square planar uh, geometry. So Wilkinson's catalyst is kind of uh, just a, a classic canonical inorganic coordination complex. This can, this can catalyze a host of different reactions, and we're just going to look at how alkene hydrogenation using this catalyst. Uh, when it performs the addition of hydrogen across a carbon-carbon double bond, it does so in a syn fashion, meaning that these two new hydrogens that are, are coming from H2 gas are being added to the same face of the alkene. And so if you perform this reaction using isotopically labeled deuterium gas, you're gonna end up finding in the product that the deuterium atoms lie on the same side of the ring. And so this is general to all alkenes uh, that undergo hydrogenation with Wilkinson's catalyst, and really with most hydrogenation catalysts. Syn addition is usually what you find. Um, Anti-addition, which would be the opposite of that, 
the isotopically labeled carbons being on opposite sides of the rings is much more uncommon. Um, and so the mechanism by which alkene hydrogenation occurs uh, uses really only steps, um, just uses steps that we've, some of the elementary steps we've looked at so far. Um, so this D8 square planar complex can undergo oxidative addition of dihydrogen, and that's then going to give us an octahedral rhodium-3 complex with two hydride ligands bound. Uh, in the next step, we need to get the olefin bound to the metal center, and so to accommodate that, uh, one of our phosphine ligands is going to dissociate, and the olefin will come in and replace it. And so we'll once again have uh, an 18 electron rhodium-3 octahedral complex with now our olefin being bound. Uh, and you'll notice that one of the hydride ligands is cis to that olefin. And so this hydride ligand is going to readily be able to insert into that olefin, and that's then going to give us a new alkyl ligand. This alkyl ligand itself is now cis to a hydride. And so this is going to be a pretty facile reductive elimination now that can take place. We'll form that second carbon hydrogen bond. That's then going to release our alkane and give us back a rhodium one complex again. Um, this is of course a, a three coordinate complex, uh, very low coordinate, very reactive. As soon as it sees hydrogen gas, it's going to perform oxidative addition. That's gonna then take it right back into this catalytic cycle where it can once again coordinate an olefin and undergo hydride insertion, reductive elimination, and that can just keep going around and around and around the cycle again. Um, so Wilkinson's catalyst uh, tends to operate most quickly using sterically unencumbered alkenes. And so for something like cyclohexene, uh, we see a relatively fast rate constant. But as you start getting to more and more sterically hindered alkenes, you see that rate constant decreasing significantly. And then if you get to a tetra-substituted alkene, this then starts to become a very, very slow reaction, at least at 25 Celsius. It'll go much faster if you heat the reaction up. Um, but this can be utilized quite strategically if you have a rather complex molecule where you have multiple alkene groups and you only want to hydrogenate one of them. So if you pick your conditions very carefully, uh, you can selectively hydrogenate this, uh, this geminal disubstituted olefin right here while leaving this tri-substituted olefin untouched. Um, so this is kind of, again, one of the, the really nice benefits that we can have available to us in using a homogeneous catalyst versus a heterogeneously catalyzed process is that we can operate under relatively mild conditions. And if we pick our conditions just right, we can realize uh, a good degree of both chemoselectivity uh, and regioselectivity. And so if we were to do this using palladium on carbon, this is a very commonly employed heterogeneous hydrogenation catalyst. Uh, this is going to very quickly just hydrogenate both of the carbon-carbon double bonds in this case. Uh, if we went to rainy nickel, this is another common heterogeneous catalyst. This is not only going to hydrogenate both of our carbon-carbon double bonds, it's also going to hydrogenate our ketone into an alcohol group. And so this is just kind of a nice example of how, uh, how you can kind of judiciously pick your catalyst and your conditions um, to be able to very intricately change one functional group while leaving some other functional groups intact. Okay. Um, this is another what I think is a kind of a really cool example of using some some really beautiful chemistry to solve a very challenging problem in hydrogenation catalysis. And so um, in this case, uh, this is a really cool example, in fact, an example that ended up leading to a Nobel Prize of doing enantioselective hydrogenation. Um, this was carried out in really seminal research by William Knowles at Monsanto um, back, I, I think this, this work was done in the late 70s. Um, in, this is for the synthesis of L-DOPA. So this is a common drug to treat Parkinson's disease. Um, so in this reactant here, you notice that we have what we would call a prochiral carbon. So this olefinic carbon is bound to three different substituents. So after it undergoes hydrogenation, there's going to be a hydrogen there, and this is going to be a new chiral center. 
And so only the L enantiomer of this drug is active. The corresponding R form uh, is inactive. And so you need to be able to uh, perform this hydrogenation and only get this L isomer. So how do you do that? Well, this was actually done by using a rhodium-1 catalyst, very similar to Wilkinson's catalyst. Um, but using some really fancy phosphine ligands and using some ligands that are actually chiral at phosphorus. And so we have three different carbon substituents bound to phosphorus right here. And so if you synthesize and, and use only one enantiomer of that phosphorus ligand uh, and use it bound to rhodium in your catalyst, you can start to realize enantiomeric excesses of your hydrogenated product. Um, so what Knowles found was initially using these monodentate phosphines, you could get some decent EEs, uh, not nearly good enough for, uh, for practical use in pharmaceutical chemistry. Uh, he then showed that you could go to some of these chiral, uh, these, these um, bidentate phosphines, which are chiral at both phosphorus centers, and you can start to get really high in antioselectivities. Um, so it's possible that some of you have never, never heard or thought about chirality at something like a phosphorus center before. Um, obviously, if you hear chiral, you probably think of a carbon center. Uh, I would imagine probably in the first module of this course or, or at some point you went over chelating metal, cent uh, metal centers bound to different chelates where you can get uh, like delta and lambda isomers uh, at the metal center. Um, but chirality is possible at other main group atoms. Um, and so thinking about chirality at in group 15 of the periodic table, which is just nitrogen and, and uh, nitrogen and the elements below it going down. Uh, you've almost certainly, <coughs> excuse me, never heard of a chiral amine before. Um, and why is that? So you can get chirality in an amine. Um, and so just three different substituents bound to the amine. This here, uh, what I'm showing is the R isomer. Kind of the fourth substituent, if you will, would be that lone pair. Um, but this can undergo uh, rapid inversion um, from the R isomer to the S isomer. And this is the transition state through which it goes. And in the transition state, that lone pair is going to be in a pure 2PZ orbital. And so we have uh, a, a rigorously planar intermediate here as our transition state going through to form this other isomer. So in the, in the case of an amine, the activation barrier for this inversion is very, very low. 25 kilojoules per mole, that means this is happening millions and millions of times per second at room temperature. And so you really can't resolve one enantiomer of an amine and, and have it stay static, just stay that isomer at room temperature. Um, you can, though, do that as you, with the heavier congeners of amines as you start to go down group 15. And the reason is that activation barrier starts to go up very steeply. Um, the reason electronically why this occurs, in the case of an amine, even when it's pyramidalized here, this lone pair is almost all 2P in character already. It doesn't have very much S character. And so that means this inversion process, there's actually not a, a lot of electronic perturbation that has to occur for this, uh, for inversion to take place. Uh, however, for phosphorus in the ground state uh, pyramidalized form, uh, this lone pair actually has a lot of 3S character mixed into the 3SPZ. Um, and so that means in order for it to go planar in this transition state uh, where that lone pair has to be completely in a 3PZ orbital, there's actually a lot more perturbation of the electronic structure that has to take place there. And that results in a much, much larger activation barrier of around 150 kilojoules per mole. 150 kilojoules per mole, you are not getting over that at room temperature. You would have to go to very, very, very high temperatures to be able to get over an activation barrier like that. And so if you can synthesize either the R or the S isomer of a phosphine, uh, and it's just sitting around at room temperature, they are not going to interconvert between one another. So I think that's just kind of a nice example uh, of thinking about chirality and some non-carbon atoms and seeing how that can be really used for some important applications in chemistry. 
Okay, we have a question here. Why we have so okay, so somebody's asking why the S character is larger uh in phosphorus than in uh than in nitrogen for the pyramidalized back here. The reason is in the case of nitrogen where our valence uh, our va valence shell is the 2s and 2p orbitals, there's a relatively small energy separation between s and p. And so because of that, you tend to get a lot more sp mixing that goes into the bonding orbitals. And so there's quite a bit of s character uh, in for a means that goes into the orbitals used to form bonds to the three substituents. That means that there's not very much s character that's left over to go into the lone pair. And most of that lone pair is just 2p in character. As you start to go down the period, uh, you get a, a much larger separation between the S and the P orbitals, and you get much less mixing. And so the phosphorus uh, substituent bonds here are made up uh, mostly of phosphorus P orbitals. And so you end up with a lot of S character that ends up left over and just goes into the lone pair. And so that's kind of the reason, um, just SP mixing and the relative energies between the S and P manifolds uh, in the N equals two versus the N equals three shell that you get uh, that significant difference in character in the lone pairs between nitrogen and phosphorus. Yeah, so uh, thank you for sending me the chat on that. If you raised your hand, I never got a notification on that. So that's probably just what you'll have to do uh, if you have a question. Okay, um, so let's look a little bit about at alkene polymerization now. Um, and so this is probably one of the industrially the most important reactions um, that, is, that is utilized and that's carried out. Um, plastics, of course, are an intricate part of our everyday lives, um, and they're in many, many things that we use. And so kind of the, the father of plastics, if you were, well, were uh, two German guys named Ziegler and Nada. And so they discovered um, back in the early 20th century that a mixture of titanium catalyst and an aluminum activator could polymerize small alkenes like propene um, to, in this case, give the isotactic version of polypropene, or we're, we're just forming carbon-carbon bonds between adjacent olefins at these olefinic bonds, and, and we have regularly spaced then methyl groups branching off of that carbon-carbon chain. Uh, isotactic in this case just means that all of these methyl substituents are on the same face of that growing polymer chain, or they all have the same stereochemistry. Um, now, you might think, why does that occur? This is giving us sort of the same enantiomer at each new carbon, um, but this doesn't really look like a chiral catalyst. Where is that chiral element coming from? Uh, it turns out that you actually do have chirality at these titanium centers. I'm not going to go into why that is. You'll just hopefully have to take my word for that. Um, this reaction is actually heterogeneously catalyzed. And so um, this is occurring kind of on the surface of titanium crystallites that are present. And you do actually have a chirality element here that results in the same uh, the same stereochemistry occurring at each carbon in this growing chain. Um, so we'll look just briefly a little bit at the mechanism of how polymerization occurs and we're going to kind of just pick it up in the middle. So I'm just showing very generically here titanium with a P. P is just our growing polymer chain. So this is just some very long carbon hydrocarbon ligand. Um, and so we just have an sp3 carbon anionic down to titanium here that's cis to an open coordination site. So we have an olefin that can come in and bind to the metal center. 
will the, just then just do an insertion of our growing polymer chain into the alkene. And this is now just going to grow the polymer chain by two more carbons. It's going to leave us an open coordination site. Alkene comes in, insertion. So this is actually a very simple mechanism. And this just occurs over and over and over and over again until we get a chain termination step. And so one common chain termination step here, especially for polypropylene, where we have beta hydrogens, is we can get beta hydride elimination. And so at some point during the growth of this chain, this chain is gonna bend over into to just the right configuration where it places a hydrogen over that open coordination site. We'll get beta hydride elimination. That's going to then give us uh, our polymer chain terminated with an alkene group, which can dissociate. Um, and so that's then <coughs> going to be the end. Uh, that's going to then just leave us our, our unligated polymer chain here. So the length of the polymer chain that we get is just going to really be a function of the relative rate constants between these chain propagation and these chain termination steps. If the rate constant for propagation is much, much larger than the rate constant for chain termination, that's then going to mean on average, we're gonna get many, many insertions that occur before our chain is terminated. And that's going to give us a larger molecular weight polymer. If we have a chain termination rate constant that's quite large and, and starting to get up towards the magnitude of chain propagation, that's then going to give us very small polymer chains or maybe even just olefin oligomers as we might call them. Um, and so just the relative rate constants between those two steps is, is a really, are really important parameters to figure out uh, when you're trying to optimize some olefin, param olefin polymerization process. Uh, today, uh, let's see, we have a question. Okay, so the question is, what is the difference between heterogeneous and homogeneous catalysts? Um, Kelly, actually, do you want to do you want to get on and uh, maybe unmute yourself, or and just tell me, are you talking generally or specifically in the context of olefin polymerization? Um, hi. So I guess um, I'm I'm assuming the um, the meaning of a heterogeneous catalyst means there's like more than one metal involved. Um, is that correct? Uh, in this case, no. Um, okay. So what we're meaning by that is that the catalyst is just in a different phase from the reactants. Um, and so most commonly, and this was kind of in the first slide that I covered, um, but you'll have a catalyst that's in the solid state and your reactants will either be liquids or gases. Okay, got it. So that's Thank what you. that means in that case. It, you may have multiple metals in that solid state catalyst, and that can sometimes be referred to as, as a heterogeneous catalyst, especially if you have different types of active sites in the catalyst. Um, but in this case, it's just referring to the relative phases. Okay, got it. Thank you. Sure. Okay, um, so zeigler catalysts are, are not used very commonly anymore. Um, there's been a ton of research that's gone into finding uh, better catalysts um, for olefin polymerization. Uh, so much more commonly, uh, what are used today are metallocene type complexes, uh, especially of group four metals. So titanium, zirconium, hafnium, um, which are just bound to, to different CP ligands. Um, and so these can undergo activation with an aluminum reagent. Um, all that aluminum organometallic reagent is doing is, is just installing uh, some sort of alkyl group onto the zirconium center. We're just replacing one of those halide ligands with something like a methyl group. So this can then bind olefin, undergo insertion, and away we go in our polymerization process. And so these metallocenes uh, are oftentimes preferred because they give much narrower molecular weight distribution. So this is another important uh, property of polymers. For, for many applications, you don't want a polymer where you have a wide variation 
of molecular weights in your polymer chain. You usually want a very narrow dose distribution. You want most of your polymers to be about the same molecular weight. That tends to lead to uh, favorable physical properties. And so these metallocene catalysts can oftentimes give much narrower molecular weight distributions compared to just using the kind of the classic Zingler Nada type catalyst system. Okay, um, so let's now talk a little bit about hydroformylation. So this is the, to my knowledge, this is the oldest homogeneous, homogeneously catalyzed process that's still carried out in industry. Um, and it really is one of the most important homogeneously catalyzed processes that is carried out. Um, what we're doing in hydroformylation, hopefully the name could already give you an idea of what's going on, but we're just taking an olefin and across that double bond, we're putting on one side a four mil group and on the other side, just a hydrogen atom for hydroformylation. So this was discovered by Otto Rollin in 1938, and he actually discovered this somewhat serendipitously. So he was studying Fischer-Tropsch reactivity fischer tropsch reactivity, hopefully most of you are, are somewhat familiar with what that is. You're just taking CO and H2, a mixture of that's called syngas at very high temperatures and, and turning that into a range of different hydrocarbons and, and some oxygenated type of products. And so fischer tropsch chemistry is a heterogeneously catalyzed process. And so Otto Rowland was looking into the mechanism by which some oxygenates were formed in that process. Um, and so he noticed that there were some, not a lot, but that there were some aldehydes being produced when fischer tropsch was performed with a specific catalyst and with a catalyst that actually contains some cobalt in it. So after extensive research, what he found was that despite the fact that he was looking at a heterogeneously catalyzed process, the formation of these aldehydes was actually occurring homogeneously. And it was occurring because the carbon monoxide in the syngas mixture was resulting in the cobalt that was present in that catalyst to actually leach out and form some dicobalt octocarbonyl which itself can then react with hydrogen to form tetracarbonyl cobalt hydride. And so this is kind of our classic hydroformylation catalyst right here. Um, and so it, it's kind of funny to think about how this was found, um, but this really is how some of the most important chemical discoveries of all time have been made. You oftentimes don't go out uh, thinking I'm gonna go solve some hugely important problem today, you, you happen to run across it by happenstance. And that's exactly what happened here. And now hydroformylation is an extremely important reaction that's performed uh, on enormous scales industrially. So as I mentioned, tetracarbonyl cobalt hydride is just formed by the reaction between hydrogen and dicobalt octocarbonyl. Um, this is a very interesting organometallic compound. Um, it's actually a, a liquid at room temperature. If you can isolate it, it's, it's very difficult to work with. Um, what's also interesting is that it's actually a very strong Bronsted acid. So I don't remember exactly what the pKa of this is. I, I want to say it's, it's somewhere around four. Um, so on par with like acetic acid in terms of its Bronsted acidity. And, and that's really just because you can think of the conjugate base, which would just be cobalt tetracarbonyl anion or, or tetracarbonyl cobaltate. Uh, because the carbonyls can, through back bonding, really help stabilize that negative charge on cobalt, um, that results in that being a relatively stable conjugate base. And so you do get quite a bit of acidic character of this proton. So keep that in mind, even though we'll refer to this just classically as a hydride ligand, it really doesn't display a lot of hydritic character. In many ways, it's a bit more protic in character. Um, okay, so tetracobalt, tetracarbonyl cobalt hydride is kind of our, our canonical catalyst. The active species in, during hydroformylation though is actually tricarbonyl cobalt hydride. So that can just then form from dissociation of one carbonyl ligand to give this square planar D8 cobalt monohydride. 
Uh, hydroformylation is usually performed under very high CO pressures and usually, also usually at very high temperatures. But the reason it's performed under very high CO pressures is because you need to stop this reactivity path from happening. So as you start to dissociate CO ligands, uh, unless you have oxidative addition of hydrogen that occurs, you start to form some of these higher order cobalt carbonyl clusters, which will eventually decompose to just give metallic cobalt. And so that's just going to precipitate out as metallic cobalt that's going to be uh, inactive. And so in order to help preclude that from happening, we'll oftentimes use hundreds of bars of CO um, for this reaction to occur to, to prevent catalyst decomposition. Uh, so in terms of other metals that can be used for hydroformylation, really the only metal besides cobalt that you will ever see is rhodium. And, and in fact, rhodium is about three orders of magnitude more active for hydroformylation compared to cobalt. Rhodium also on a per molar basis is thousands of times more expensive than cobalt. So industrially, uh, you will see instances where rhodium is used and you will see interest in instances where cobalt is used. Uh, so let's just look a little bit at the mechanism by which hydroformylation can occur. Uh, don't worry about what's going on up here. Just notice that we have tetracarbonyl cobalt hydride, which can undergo that CO dissociation that I mentioned to give our active species tricarbonyl cobalt hydride. So 16 electron complex, it can bind an olefin ligand. Um, which is going to bind cis to a hydride. And so that can give us our migratory insertion to now give an alkyl ligand, in this case, an N-propyl ligand. Once again, we now have an unsaturated complex, 16 electrons. So it's going to bind CO that's floating around in great excess to give an 18 electron tetracarbonyl cobalt propyl. Uh, we'll then get insertion of the propyl ligand into one of the COs, and that's going to then form. Uh, form our acyl ligand. And then the last two steps to finish off our aldehyde, we just need to replace this bond to carbon uh, with a hydrogen. We're just going to make that happen by oxidative addition of hydrogen at cobalt and then reductive elimination of the, uh, of the acyl and one of the hydride ligands to give our, uh, to give our butanol product. Um, so there are important regioselectivity issues to keep in mind here if you are hydroformulating any olefin other than ethylene. Um, so the most important substrate for hydroformulation is propene, and that's because butanol is, uh, is synthesized on enormous scales, largely for the production of one butanol. So you would just take one butanol and hydrogenate it to one butanol. This is a really important industrial solvent and is used for a host of other uh, applications. Um, and so butanol is really the product that you want out of propene hydroformylation. This, this 2-methylpropanol does not have nearly as many uses. Um, in some cases, it may just essentially be discarded uh, or sold for far, uh, a far lower cost than the butanol is. And so you'd really like to think of a way in which you could form much more butanol um, and kind of selectively get this regioisomer and end up with very little of the, the less desirable 2-methylpropanol. Fortunately, uh, using most catalysts, uh, you tend to get much higher amounts of butanol than 2-propanol out. And so you get about four parts butanol to one part 2-methylpropanol. Um, oftentimes, this will be referred to in hydroformylation catalysis. This will just be talked about in terms of a linear to branched ratio, our, our linear aldehyde to our branched aldehyde. And so with kind of these typical cobalt catalysts, somewhere around four to one is going to be a pretty typical linear to branched ratio. Um, but people would really, people in industry would really like to be able to get that much higher so that they're not wasting 20% of the product that comes out. Um, so first, let's think about just mechanistically how these two different products occur. Um, so from our, our tricarbonyl cobalt hydride, which is our active intermediate, we'll bind olefin, 
cis to the hydride. And so then our hydride migration step, this is going to be our regioselective, our, our, the step that determines regioselectivity. If the hydride migrates to this terminal carbon, the cobalt is going to bond to the internal carbon right here. And that's going to give us an isopropyl ligand. Uh, which is then going to lead, if it carries on through the rest of the hydroformylation mechanism, to that branched 2-methylpropanol. If hydride instead migrates to the internal carbon, that is going to give us our terminal, our N-propyl ligand, um, which once it carries on through the rest of the mechanism is going to give us butanol, one butanol. Um, and so this is really the, the desirable direction that we'd love to push this reaction in to the extent possible. Okay, um, so before I talk a little bit about how we push it in that direction, um, let's kind of just, uh, as, as a bit of an exercise here, look at the cobalt catalyzed hydroformylation of uh, four octene. All right, one, two, three, yeah, four octane. Um, so this is the product distribution that you get out of this. And this might surprise you a little bit looking at this because you might be thinking, well, if I add hydrogen and, and a formal group across this, uh, I actually think that the only product I should be able to get out is with the aldehyde group at the four position, right? Because you, you kind of have a center of symmetry right here through the double bond. Um, so this would be the four position, or this could be the four position, depending on which way you count. Um, but if you look at the product distribution, you actually get all of the different isomers out here. And in fact, you get the linear isomer actually um, as the majority of the product. So how exactly is that occurring? So you might remember I, I, when we first talked, when we talked about olefin isomerization earlier, I said that this can be an important competitive process that can occur while you are carrying out other types of catalytic reactivity. And so this is an instance where we have olefin isomerization that is competitive with hydroformylation. And so let's just think about how some of these different products are formed. And so let's start here on the left where we have our 4-octene that's bound to our cat catalytically active species. It can undergo insertion of the hydride into the olefin. That's going to give us a 4-octyl ligand. From here, we can go one of three ways. We can go right back from whence we came, beta hydride eliminate this hydride and just go back to a bound 4 uh, uh, bound 4-octane ligand. We can bind CO to this unsaturated species and have it continue on down the line to hydroformylation. And so this is then going to give us that product with the 4-mil group at the 4-carbon in the chain. Or we can beta hydride eliminate the other the hydrogen at the other beta position right here. And if we do that, that's now going to give us a three, uh, a, a three octene ligand. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, which itself then um, could undergo hydride insertion, uh, and we could then go on down the line here to give the product with the formal group at the three position. Uh, it could go backwards to go right back to here, or it could beta hydride eliminate the hydride that's at the two position, which is then going to give us a two octene ligand uh, that's bound to cobalt. And so um, I think this is a really good exercise if you want to in your free time, um, just kind of finish off this mechanism and show that you can delineate how the products with the aldehyde at the two and at the one position are formed through both olefin isomerization and hydroformylation. Okay, so we really want to increase the linear to branch ratio to the extent possible because we want those linear aldehydes out of this reaction. So what are a couple different strategies that can be utilized to make that occur? Uh, one common one is to replace some of the CO ligands in our catalysts with really bulky phosphenes. And so this is one example here with just a bunch of organic junk on this phosphorus. Uh, we have this BBN ring and then an, an icosyl, a, a 20 carbon long chain. 
Um, the reason that this bulky phosphine is going to push us more towards the linear aldehydes is because in this regioselectivity determining hydride migration step, you can imagine what these two alkyl complexes look like. If we get hydride migration that gives us the terminal alkyl ligand, this is gonna allow us to orient the alkyl ligand away from this bulky phosphorus. But if hydride migrates to give us the branched alkyl ligand, this is gonna result in some steric clashing here between the branched uh, alkyl and the phosphorus. And that's gonna then really push the equilibrium for this step uh, back towards the hydride and really make us favor this, what I'm calling here, anti-Markovnikov migration, which just gives us uh, the terminal alkyl ligand and is going to give us the linear aldehyde. And so using steric bulk in the catalyst is a great way um, to push us towards higher linear to branch ratios. Another way is to use rhodium catalysts instead of cobalt. And so in general, most rhodium catalysts tend to give much higher linear to branch selectivities compared to cobalt. Um, in fact, in this case, for a relatively simple cobalt rhodium catalyst, uh, we can get up to 20 to 1 linear to branched ratios. And quite amazingly, this can actually be done at room temperature uh, with only one bar of syngas. Um, and so we don't have to go to those really high pressures of CO in order to be able to get this reactivity. So as I, as I kind of touched on, you have this trade-off between with rhodium, you can get really high reactivity. You can also get very high linear to branch ratios, um, but the trade-off is rhodium is far more expensive than cobalt on a molar basis. And so uh, when a given plant is deciding which type of catalyst they're going to use, they're just going to need to look at what are the exact product distributions that they need, what can they sell the linear and the branched isomers for, and how much are a cobalt versus a rhodium catalyst going to cost them. And, and based off of that economic analysis, they'll decide if they're going to use a cobalt catalyzed process or a rhodium catalyzed process. Okay, um, another reaction here, I'll just touch on this very briefly because this is also a very important reaction. Uh, it's the Monsanto acetic acid synthesis. Um, it's one of the largest volume ways it's used to synthesize acetic acid, which is a very important commodity chemical. Um, and it's just synthesizing it from methanol and CO. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as methanol carbonylation because that's formally sort of what's happening. You're inserting this CO into the carbon-oxygen bond of, of methanol. From a mechanistic standpoint, that's actually not what's happening at all. Um, so this reaction is rhodium catalyzed, but it also occurs in the presence of hydroiodic acid, which is, of course, a very strong mineral acid. Um, and that's going to react with methanol to give methyl iodide. And methyl iodide is actually going to be what reacts with rhodium. Um, it can undergo oxidative addition of the, of the carbon iodide bond to give a rhodium methyl complex. We now have a rhodium methyl that's cis to a CO. You can probably guess what's going to happen next. We get insertion to give an acetyl ligand. CO comes in and binds to the open coordination site. So we once again have an octahedral complex. Um, and then the final step here, at least as far as rhodium is concerned, is reductive elimination of the acetyl group and the iodide. That gives acetyl iodide, so an acid iodide. You've heard of acid chlorides in organic chemistry. This is just the iodine equivalent. It's going to be very, very electrophilic at carbon. It will rapidly react with water that's around uh, to give acetic acid and liberate an equivalent of hydroiodic acid. Okay, um, so with just a little bit of time left here, I just want to briefly touch on uh, a really important class of reactivity called cross-coupling, and specifically looking at cross-coupling as a way to form carbon-carbon bonds. So we looked at a few steps in some reactions where we form carbon-carbon bonds in, in hydroformylation, for instance. Um, methanol carbonylation, we formed a carbon-carbon bond. Um, but cross-coupling is, is perhaps a much more general method of trying to form carbon-carbon bonds, taking two different 
uh, organic fragments and just stitching them together using some catalyst. Um, our organic fragments are gonna come from either uh, a metal bound carbon or, or maybe some main group element bound to carbon, as well as a different species that's bound to what's called X here. X is usually always for the purposes of cross coupling a halogen. So this is gonna be something like an organic chloride, organic bromide and organic iodide. And so this is an incredibly versatile and extremely important class of reactions and enough so that it was awarded the, or its discovery was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2010. Um, you can only give the Nobel Prize to three people. If you could have given it to more, there would have been several more people that would surely have been thrown in here. Um, but heck, Nikishi and Suzuki are, are really landmark names in organic and organometallic chemistry due to their contributions to carbon-carbon cross-coupling chemistry. And so as far as the steps that are going to be really important in uh, in cross-coupling, we're going to see a lot of oxidative addition and reductive elimination. Oxidative addition is, uh, is how we're going to get one of our carbon our carbon groups that we're going to stitch together bound to a metal center. And so this is that organic halide that I talked about. One step in virtually and almost all carbon-carbon cross-coupling schemes is going to involve an oxidative addition to give us uh, some new organometallic species. Reductive elimination is maybe the most important step that's going to take place because it's going to be the step by which we form that all-important carbon-carbon bond. So we're going to need to get to some organometallic species where we have our two organic fragments that are bound in a cis geometry to one metal center to allow us to perform that reductive elimination and give us our cross-coupled product. Okay, um, by far the most common metal that's utilized for cross-coupling catalysis is palladium. It is almost always palladium. And the reason that palladium is so good for cross-coupling is because palladium lies in a real sweet spot in the periodic table where it can perform both oxidative addition and reductive elimination very well. And so we can easily perform two of those very important steps in our cross-coupling cycle. Usually we're going to have as an active intermediate a zero valent palladium center. This is going to be the species that performs that oxidative addition, right? Oxidative addition, we remember, increases the oxidation state of our metal by two units. So if we're going to go up by two units, uh, we need to start from a lower oxidation state. So palladium zero here after oxidative addition gives us palladium two. Uh, we also need uh, an active intermediate that's very low coordinate because we've got to form two new bonds. Um, and so oftentimes you might go from a two coordinate palladium zero center. This is only 14 electron complex, which upon oxidative addition is going to give us our 16 electron complex, which is going to adopt a square planar geometry. Uh, in terms of bonds undergoing oxidative addition, uh, the oxidative addition tends to go faster for the heavier organic halides. So organic iodides tend to react much faster than organic bromides, which tend to react much, much faster than organic chlorides. And organic fluorides are, are really not relevant at all. They, they very, very rarely will ever undergo oxidative addition. Okay, um, so if you want to do cross-coupling with, organic, with uh, organic chlorides, which are, are very, very slow to undergo oxidative addition, you oftentimes got to go even lower than, lower coordinate than two coordinate palladium. Um, and I apologize for the Comic Sans font here. I, I totally swiped this slide from someone else, so please don't judge me for this choice of font. Uh, but so if you want to do oxidative addition of something like an organic chloride, you are likely need, going to need to go down to monocoordinate palladium zero. So this is a really, really reactive species here, um, is going to be in equilibrium with the two coordinate palladium zero species. Um, but usually here, this K minus one, uh, where just our, our ligand that came off goes back on. 
is much, much slower than this K2, which gives us this oxidative addition. And so that, that's this slow rate constant for oxidative addition is really one of the biggest reasons why uh, organic chlorides can be very difficult partners um, for cross-coupling catalysis. Okay, um, so one method that can be used to help overcome that problem of getting a lot of monoligated palladium zero in solution to do uh, oxidative addition of something like an aryl chloride is to use these really fancy biaryl based phosphates. And so these were, uh, these were really made popular by the work of Steve Buckwald at MIT in the early 2000s. Um, so these active catalysts are then formed not by dissociation of a phosphine from a higher coordinate species, um, but they're actually produced in situ. And so you notice you actually add in a palladium two starting material along with this phosphine uh, under an N2 atmosphere, so no oxygen around. And if you heat this mixture up, you'll get spontaneous reduction of palladium two to give palladium zero, and the phosphine will bind to that. And you'll have this active species in solution, and importantly, you won't have any free phosphine floating around that could come in and bind to palladium over here. Another important feature of this is this kind of interaction that I'm drawing with this dotted line to uh, this ipso carbon in the biphenyl ring. So this you might call a hemi label interaction. This is a very weak interaction. Um, it's strong enough that it's going to help this mono ligated species hang around in solution for longer such that it can hopefully undergo oxidative addition. Um, but it's weak enough that it will very easily come off once oxidative addition does occur. And so this is a really important class of cross coupling catalysts that use this these biaryl phosphine type of ligands. And, and some of these can even perform the oxidative addition of aryl chlorides at room temperature, which, which is quite impressive. Okay, um, just a couple minutes left. I, I just wanna very briefly uh, look at, at kind of a, a bit more of a complete mechanism for cross-coupling. Most carbon-carbon cross-coupling mechanisms involve canonically three steps, okay? So going from that palladium zero active species, we have that oxidative addition. We also know that we're going to have a reductive elimination, right? And this is going to form our new carbon-carbon bond. The question though is how do we get from here to here? How do we get this second R prime group to bind to palladium? And this is usually accomplished by a step called transmetallation. And transmetal, the transmetallation reagent that's used for cross-coupling catalysis is generally uh, what determines the name of that given cross-coupling mechanism. And so uh, Suzuki coupling uses organoboron reagents. Stilly coupling uses organic tin reagents. Here's some other examples here. Um, but these organometallic reagents are going to react with palladium and are going to transfer their organic ligand onto palladium and give us uh, that diorganopalladium species that can undergo reductive elimination. If you only know one cross coupling, uh, the name of one cross coupling reaction, you should probably make it the Suzuki reaction, or sometimes called the Suzuki Miara cross coupling reaction. So it's it's that reaction which uses uh, organoboron species, oftentimes boronic acids, as the transmetallation reagent. So this is an incredibly versatile uh, and very powerful class of cross coupling reactions um, that are are used to form a host of different products. Um, and so I'll just show you very briefly kind of how that transmetallation step might occur with boronic acids. So usually Suzuki reactions are, are not performed under rigorously anhydrous conditions. There'll be a little bit of water around and there will always be some sort of Bronsted base that's around, usually a rather weak base, something like carbonate or phosphate. So what that'll mean is that there'll be a little bit of hydroxide that'll be floating around in solution. We know that three coordinate boron is electron deficient. It's a very good Lewis base. Um, and so it can bind that hydroxide to give a tetracoordinated boronate species. Um, so that anionic boronate can then come in 
and react with our palladium that's already undergone oxidative addition. We have one of our R groups already on palladium. And this boronate's gonna displace that halide on palladium and bring this R prime group into close proximity to palladium and eventually transfer through transmetallation that R prime group to palladium. That'll just spit out boron, um, boronic acid, um, or boric acid, sorry. And uh, from here, we're well set up to undergo reductive elimination. Um, another way by which this could possibly occur is this hydroxide that's floating around could react directly with palladium too and displace the halide uh, to give a palladium hydroxide. This palladium hydroxide could then bind to the boronic acid. Once again, bring R prime in close to palladium, transfer R prime to palladium, and then we have our diorganic palladium species that can undergo reductive elimination. Okay, so it's 11 o'clock. We'll go ahead and stop there. Um, I'll stay on for another minute or two if anybody has any questions they want to ask. Um, but if not, have a great rest of your day and stay safe. <laughs>